Hi, welcome to Artistic Adventures. I'm Holly from BB Library, and today our artist is Georgia O'Keeffe. And she's important because she was the, really the first female artist to gain enthusiasm and respect in the United States. Even during her lifetime, a lot of people don't become famous until after they're gone. She was um, considered one of America's most successful artists. Um, we ran into her when we were reading um, the book on Yayoi Kusama. Kusama, when she came to America, tried to tried to kind of break into the New York art scene and wasn't having luck. And so she thought about what she should do, and she got the idea to um, to write to the most successful female artist in the world, and that happened to be Georgia O'Keeffe. So she wrote to her and um, asked her how she could um, get attention in, in the New York art scene. And um, Georgia O'Keeffe happened to be coming into New York, and she actually visited her and looked at her work and then promoted her work to her own art dealer. And uh, Kusama got her first um, exhibit out of that and got started. So that says a lot about uh, Kusama's talent, but it also says to me a lot about Georgia O'Keeffe, that she was willing to start and help out this young woman just starting out, not even anybody from America, but just a young artist that... that so I think that that says an awful lot about her. So actually, O'Keefe got her recognition in much the same way. When she got out of college, she trained to be a teacher. Her, her parents um, felt that it would be important that she had um, something other than just artists. So she spent a lot of time. Could you imagine having Georgia O'Keefe as your, as your school art teacher? That'd be amazing. But so she taught in schools as well as colleges and she got a job, um, she was in Texas for quite a while at a teaching college, and she got a job in South Carolina. And while she was there, she just was doing some work of her own, and she sent it off to a friend of hers from college. And she lived in New York, and she took them to uh, the gallery of a man by the name of, um, uh, sorry, the name of, of Arthur Stiglitz. Kind of, I blanked there for a moment. Um, he was very prominent and famous. He was a photographer of great renown, amazing, as well as um, he, he was this art dealer. And so um, George's friend took some of her drawings and he saw in her a great deal of talent and put her into his next show. And they got her her first renown. At that point, she was living in South Carolina. But he contacted her and said that he really saw a lot of potential in her work and he offered to arrange an apartment and, a, and studio space for her to work for one year where she could just paint and not have to worry about teaching and painting at the same time. So she took up that offer and um, that's really how she got her start. But also a big change in her life is she and Stieglitz started out as a professional relationship became kind of friends and admirers of each other's work and in 1924 they got married so she was his um she was his wife so that um you know that that's kind of the beginning of this so um she is considered we always we talk we've we've seen the you know the abstract people that are are dealing with with strong feelings and and painting things that we really can't recognize anything and we've We've seen the expressionists that um, are definitely with feelings. There we've got Jackson Pollock that are making um, very powerful paintings that do emote feelings when you look at them. Well, she is considered to be a modernist. In fact, what they say, the first American modernist. And that also deals with feelings. It also deals with painting and choosing colors and things that's going, is how they're feeling and what they're seeing. But also it's, they don't tend to be the same, they tend to paint things that you can recognize what they are. Uh, they may show a different view of them. They want you to look at things in different ways. And when we start looking at her work, you'll see what I mean. You can definitely look at her work and say, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. That's a, but yet it's not exactly what you would see. Sometimes it's from a different perspective. And sometimes things are put in areas in the painting that are there to have you look at something, but not look at it exactly as it would be you know, in nature, and nature was a big thing with her. So um, uh, let's look at, look at the book for today. I had a hard time with the book because every other artist, I maybe had, I had one choice or I had two choices at most. I had so many choices of books, and there were some, I really like this through George, George's eyes. 
um, I think that the art in it looks very much like Georgia O'Keeffe's art. I think it does a really, really good job of representing that. So that's one I would recommend. But um, it, it did one aspect of her art. It talked about this whole idea of feeling and and trying to hear the shapes and see the colors. And you, know, you probably remember that from Kandinsky a little bit, although he was definitely abstract. Um, so this did a good job talking about kind of her, um, her ideas about painting. But I didn't think it told you enough about her to use. So that's one that I kind of rejected for that, for that reason. And um, another one that I think is absolutely gorgeous is this book called George's Bones. I would recommend that too. And this um, dealt mainly with her time in New Mexico, which we'll read more about. And it did talk about her, her childhood. But I didn't think that this one gave the perfect, the, you know, gave enough information to kind of get a feel for her. So the one that I did choose is called My Name is Georgia, a portrait by uh, Jeanette Winter. And this one, uh, Jeanette Winter is an artist herself, and her stuff does look a lot like a period of time. In fact, look at those clouds because we'll see those again of, of Georgia O'Keeffe. But I think it did a good job of giving us an overview of her life and her work. So I chose that. She chose to tell this as, um, as a, an autobiography in a way. Now, usually an autobiography is you telling the, your, your own story. In a biography, it would be like me telling your story. And she chose to, to do this as if it's um, Georgia O'Keeffe talking about her life but really it's Jeanette Winter. There are a few places in there that does have quotes from Georgia O'Keeffe, and I will let you know where those are because she says some very interesting things. All right, here we are. Um, my name is Georgia, a portrait by Jeanette Winter, and it's published by Harcourt Brace and Company. All right, this is gonna give you a clue right here to some of the things she painted. Um, Georgia O'Keeffe was born on a farm in Wisconsin in 1887. When I was 12 years old, I knew what I wanted to be, an artist. This is a quote, I've always known what I wanted. When I was small, I played alone for hours and hours and hours, and a quote, I was satisfied to be all by myself. I did things other people didn't do. When my sisters wore sashes, I didn't. When my sisters wore stockings, I wore none. And I let my, when my sisters wore braids, I let my black hair fly. I rode to town every Saturday to copy pictures from the stack in the art teacher's cupboard. At home, I looked out my window and drew pictures of what I saw. A quote, maybe I could make something beautiful. At school in Chicago, I drew from statues in the museum. At school in New York, I painted one still life painting a day, every day. At school, I painted my teacher's ideas. We've seen that with all of these artists, they start off painting what they see and painting what their teachers are asking, but things change, here we go. When, but when school days were over, I went out into the wild, wide world to discover my own ideas. I went to the Texas Plains, to the wild west of my childhood books. Quote, you have never seen sky. It is wonderful. I walked into the sunset. I felt the wind across the plains. I painted the sunset and the sky and the wonderful loneliness and emptiness of the place. I painted day and night. A quote, I worked till my head felt all light in the top. I have things in my head that are not like what anyone else has taught me, shapes and ideas. But I bundled up my paintings and went to New York City to be where other artists lived. I walked down the canyons of steel. I lived high up in the clouds and painted what I saw from my windows. But sometimes, what I saw from my window was the far away calling me. And that's a term that she used throughout her life. In fact, one of the paintings we're gonna look at is um, 
has got that title in it. I painted a garden in the city. I wanted everyone to see the flowers the way I saw them. I looked closely at the flowers. I painted a camellia. I painted it big so people would notice. I painted a jack in the pulpit. I painted it big so people would see. I painted poppies and petunias and sunflowers and jimson weeds and irises and apple blossoms. My garden bloomed until everyone saw the flowers the way I saw them. But still, I looked at the sky. This is a quote. The distance has always been calling me. I went to the New Mexico desert, quote, so far away that no one ever comes. I was satisfied to be all by myself. It was too dry for flowers to grow, but there were bones. I gathered the bones, big bones, little bones, short bones, long bones, a cow's skull, a horse's skull, a ram's skull, and brought the bones home to paint. Quote, one day I held up one against the sky and saw the blue through that hole. I painted what I saw. I saw the sky and the red hills. I walked in the hills at daybreak and twilight, at noon and in starlight. Quote, I painted the arms of two red hills reaching out to the sky and holding it. I painted the Pernodal Mountains in the far away. I painted it over and over and over again, and then again and again. Quote, God told me that if I painted that mountain enough, he'd give it to me. I drove my Model A across the desert and back and up and down over the hills. I painted in my studio on wheels until the afternoon bees chased me home. Even in the winter, I went out into the far away and painted in the bitter cold. I painted when the wind was so strong, it nearly blew me away. Quote, I did things other people don't do. I climbed my ladder to the night sky to wait for the sun. I slept under the stars to see the morning sky when I awoke. I stayed in the desert. My hair turned from black to gray to white as white as the bones. I still walked the red hills. My pile of bones grew. My flowers bloomed in the desert and the Pernodal was mine. And the sky. Oh, it was still wonderful. I painted the sky one more time. I painted my sky big so people would see the sky the way I did. I worked from dawn to dusk every day for weeks and months. And then as I painted the last cloud, the sun slipped behind the pet noodle. I laid, down my, I laid my brushes down, quote, kiss the sky for me. Georgia O'Keeffe lived to be 98 years old. In museums all across the land, people see her flowers, deserts, hills, cities, and skies, the way she did. Okay, I thought that book did kind of capture the spirit of um, Georgia O'Keeffe. So I've got some photos. Uh, as, as I said, her husband, um, Arthur Stiglitz was um, a very famous photographer, and one of his favorite subjects was Georgia O'Keeffe. He made, <clears throat> excuse me, well over 500 portraits of her, Lo just lots and lots of them. So here's one from 1918, which would have been just after he had, he had met her. This is a headshot he took of her. And here's another one for the same thing. This is her. It looks like she's, um, she's working. I think this is a really beautiful picture. And here's a later one, 1953. Um, and this is not taken by her husband, who um, I think at that point had died. Um, 1953, yeah. And this is taken by another very famous photographer, Ansel Adams, who is known for his black and white photographs of the West. Uh, you wanna see, wanna see some beautiful 
photography. Look up Ansel Adams. So this is a, a, a picture he took of her. And um, this last one is just one of her at home in New Mexico, uh, which is, this is exactly, if you were to say, who is um, Georgia O'Keeffe, this is what my impression of her is, is that. One thing, um, a few years ago, the Peabody Essex Museum had an exhibit of Georgia O'Keeffe, not so much her works, they had some of her paintings, but mainly it was her clothes. And uh, can you guess what color clothes she liked to wear? Almost everything there was black or was white. And I have never seen anything like it. The clothes were works of art themselves. They were tiny and very detailed. They didn't look particularly, you know, what you would say look girly or even feminine. They looked very, you know, kind of, I don't know what. Um, but when you got up close, they had tiny, tiny little buttons and um, tiny little little stitches and, and little details. Um, lots of smocking and pleating. It was amazing. Um, I spent more time in there and I'm usually not one, you know, I kind of throw on whatever I feel for the day. I don't worry about my clothes very much. And I think she would probably say that about herself, but I'll tell you, a lot of work went into those clothes that she had. I spent just hours looking at all the little stitches and it was, it was a fascinating, fascinating exhibit. All right, well, here's another painting. This is one that she did, um, in 1925, um, it, it looks unlike in anything else in her, in her work in some ways to me. This is the Radiator Building at night in New York City. Just wanted to show you a different style. All right, here, let's get into what she's known for. First of all, um, 1924, this is Red Canna. Here's one of her flowers. And a lot of people, a lot of artists paint flowers, That's, but she painted them up close and sometimes only small portions of it. I think all the ones, the, the three that I have here are just up close. Some of them are just like, just, you know, inside the flower or something. So this is Red Canna. Uh, this next one is 1927's Oriental Poppies. And this last flower uh, is 1932's, it's called Jimson Weed. And this one um, is famous because it sold um, in 2014, I think. It sold for 44 and a half million dollars. It's the highest any price paid for uh, a work of art by a woman ever. So this Jimson weed um, is is notorious in some ways. All right, so she's known for her flowers. She painted, um, you know, hundreds of paintings of flowers. Um, she has a whole series that she did. She went to Hawaii at one point to do some commercial work. And um, so, and here's some of the work that kind of is her New Mexico sort of work. She went, uh, she visited New Mexico um, went with a, went and stayed with a friend uh, fairly early on when she, when she was married and fell in love with it. So she took, so she was dividing her time between New Mexico and then New York with her husband. And she ended up buying a house that she called Ghost Ranch. It was uh, like a dude ranch where you know, tourists would go and ride horses. And it was a pr fairly primitive place and it was not good in the winter. So she would spend time at Ghost Ranch. And it, it, um, I've got a picture that shows the view out the window of, um, oh, I didn't put that on the, um, oh yes I did. That was the earlier, that's the, um, yeah, so, um, and that just didn't work in the winter. So she ended up buying an, another home and renovating it and, uh, you know, with a, with a good studio and lots of windows so she could look outside at the nature that she loved. And so she kind of went back and forth between New Mexico and then to New York with her husband until he died. And then she made New Mexico her permanent home. And so, so here are some pictures from... Her, from New Mexico of hers. The first one's called Ram's Head with Hollyhocks. And if you look at that, it's pretty cool. Uh, this, you know, she did a lot of painting of, of skulls. But what's, what's odd about it? Is she painting exactly what she's seeing? It, it's almost like she's put two pictures together, a landscape that she saw and a picture of the skull. Why, why do you think that she would do it like that? Probably because you know she's a modernist. She she 
that's in her mind how she saw that and wanted us to see it. And to be honest, if she had painted that whole back scene of the, the, you know, the beautiful mountain and the desert and then put just the bones down in the sand, we wouldn't really pay attention to them at all. Here, that's our focus. It's showing us where it came from in the background rather than the beautiful landscape being, being our focal point. It definitely is that. She's, she did this again. Here's um, uh, Cow Skull and Roses is the next one. And that um, is kind of the same. It, it isn't, I don't think that she could have put that any way except in her imagination to do that. And here's the last one. I think this one has got just such gorgeous colors. And here we have, she uses that term far away from far away nearby is what she calls this one. It's just really, really pretty colors. And the last one I'm gonna show you now is one called Ladder to the Moon. And this one is also very different. Uh, in the book, it showed how she did have a ladder. She liked to climb up to the roof of her house and, and lay up there. And I think she just had that, like that idea of ladders. She did paint quite a few pictures of ladders. But this one I don't think is, like if you had shown me this picture, I wouldn't have said, that's a Georgia O'Keeffe. I would have thought it was someone else. All right, so um, I ha actually have three different things that, that I'm going to suggest. Uh, one I'm going to do, but the others, I'm, well, maybe two, going to suggest um, that you try at home because um, a lot of her things was colors and feelings. You know, what colors evoke the feeling. So one thing that she did or that, that, um, is that when she painted something, she would choose the colors that she felt would indicate how she was, you know, what were the emotions or the feelings behind that. And one exercise that was very common in those times was to, to take, and uh, what I'm gonna suggest we do, I'm gonna get my, get my camera down, so we can see the table. Go to my, go to my list of, all right, so, some of my stuff here is kind of faint, but we'll see. I thought I did this. Yes, there we go. Is to take take a piece of paper and just put it, just make it into into quarters in any way at all that you would, any way you would like. Um, there's my page. This is, I'm using watercolors, um, even though um, Stieglitz told. Um, Georgia had to quit painting in watercolors because he felt that it was something of an amateur woman painter, which is exactly what I am, so it's perfect. And so what I did is on each of these squares, I wrote, um, I chose to do, um, I chose to do four things in my life that um, were kind of emotional, kind of happy experiences. One of which I wrote over here, I wrote Emma, that's the birth of my daughter which was definitely um, such a happy, exciting period. I took one from my childhood. Um, I, wanted a, I wanted a dog very, very badly when I was like seven, six, seven, eight years old. And when I was eight, we came home one day. And um, in fact, I did a lot of painting that I painted dogs. Uh, came home to find that my parents had brought, bought us a dog. And I still to this day can remember how happy I felt. So that's a happy experience. Another one was, um, the first date with my husband, that was so exciting. He was, he was just so wonderful. And the other one was my first trip to England. It actually went to meet my husband's family. And I was so taken by, by the country and, and everything that I saw there. So those would be my four things. So this is, you're not painting a picture at all. You're just painting. All you're gonna be painting is the, um, the feelings around, you know, what color kind of expressed your feelings. So I'm gonna start with my first trip to England. And, Definitely, the color that that I I associate with that is um, is green because I had never seen any place that was so so green. So um, and my green has to be a happy green because it was just such a happy time. I'm just gonna so just do whatever you'd like into that into that space that um, kind of shows how you're how you're feeling. I'm gonna put in some. Um, a little bit of red because um, I associate red with um, myself um, with with kind of love. So just just have fun. Just do something now. Um, definitely, 
with the birth of my daughter. Um, I'm going to start with a heart shape because, oh my gosh. And for me, there's something that um, I, I am a child. My, my parents um, adopted my brother and me. And so I just remember when I had my daughter, I was so happy because she was really the first person that I ever knew that, um, that I was related to by blood. And that just was so overwhelming to me and so happy. So I'm gonna, just going to keep that heart there. You don't have to make shapes. In fact, you probably shouldn't, but I, I just had to because it was just... So just making some things that that just kind of express how you were feeling. And, and let's see. So you can just, um, just do that. Choose um, four things. They don't have to be, they can be maybe times you were sad, but um, I, I'm, I'm so positive. I, I just couldn't come up with sad times. I have to come up with happy times. Um, you can do anything. And with them, the thing I like about watercolors is you can just, you can also just drip water onto your, onto your watercolors and it will kind of put things together and, and change them, change the whole texture and consistency. So, so there, I actually like that one better now that it's all kind of blended together. So that's number one is so just divide a sheet of paper into, into four and write four. They could, they don't have to be events. They could be things you feel very strongly about. Um, uh, and, um, and do that. So that's number one. Number two is something that um, was a principle that Georgia O'Keeffe was taught when she was um, uh, the, in Texas at the working, um, teaching at the teacher's college. Her mentor there um, had a way of doing that. I, I did this very light. I hope you can, hope you can see this. In fact, the camera itself is... Um, is putting a shadow on it. So I drew just a scene of some place that I thought was really beautiful, and it was a lake in upstate New York. And so I've got my I've got my lake, and there was some mountains in the background, and some pine trees, and um, it was actually kind of a like a state park. So I, I drew, drew exactly as I kind of remembered it. So there was a little board that had a map on it and stuff, and there was the pathway, and the pathway went all around, all around. So I just in pencil, I just drew that. So that's step one. So step one, just draw any scene. It can it, do, it, do it from nature rather than a person or a thing. Uh, look out your backyard. Draw your backyard. Um, just see if there's some place you remember. If you love going out to Crane Beach, draw that. If you, um, if you love going out walking around Breakheart, you know, do that. If you like the common, anything at all that, you, that you'd like to draw. So stage one is just to very kind of just quickly and not, not with too much detail that. Then you're going to take that, that picture and you're going to change it. And so the first step is you are going to draw it again, this time without the details that you had before. You can also make it a little bit closer up. So I made this closer up. Things right away you can tell I got rid of. I, I did not feel the need to put in the, um, the map. My trees now are just squiggles. The lake is uh, smaller, well, it's, it's larger. I mean, I just took the end of the lake. I got rid of them, of just a lot, a lot of the details. And now, rather than having, um, I initially drew three mountains. I only have got the, the two big ones there. So step two is to take and simplify it down to just like basic shapes. So my trees are just like squiggly, circly things. I got a little bit up close. And the last step is to take that one that you did and turn it rather than having it right now and in paper landscape is the long way um so it's sideways the long way and portrait is so that it's um the the long way goes up and down so you take your um you do your i'm sorry i should have said before do it do it in uh do your original one in just landscape and then you're going to take and you're going to take another piece of paper and turn this one so that it is portrait. And you're only going to take a third of this painting. So you're not going to do the whole thing. You can make it so it's this third here in the center. It can be that third or it can be this third. You're only going to do a third of it. So about that much of it. And you're going to blow it up. 
So here is my third, my third of it. I, I actually took, the piece I decided to take was the end of the lake, because I like the shape of that, and I like the shape of the, of the mountain there. So here we go. So if you can see this, this is, as I say, it's, I did it really light, but I'm gonna paint it so you'll see. So here we go. So here is my, um, my third of the one. There's the end of the lake right there. And I put some more trees back in, but I'm not gonna do them like that. And there's just one hill with just a little bit of that one. And there is, a, um, I put a cloud up there, whereas I put several clouds in the other. All right, so then, um, then what you do is you paint this. So, so I'm gonna start with, um, with the lake. And lakes really aren't blue, but this is, um, this is my, my painting. So I, it can be anything. I'm gonna put a little bit of black in there and I'm gonna try to, Try to get it so it's not quite so blue by just adding a little bit more water. And I'm just using, um, in fact, these aren't even, these are just dollar store, dollar store watercolors, which I like. And I should, if I was smart, I would have put some paper underneath what I was doing so I don't get on the tape. There we go. So there's, there's my lake, which is, and um, let's see the mountains. The mountains, when I was there, again, you don't have to do things realistically, and so I'm gonna make it, and I am, I am using, um, I'm using the little tray to mix and because there's no details I don't have I, initially I would have had to gone in would have had to would have had to draw a whole lot more I would have had to draw trees and things in so you kind of you get the idea um, I'm gonna show you in just a second um, a picture of some um, mountains that O'Keefe did because um, she took things to simple forms. She didn't paint individual trees. She didn't paint individual ridges. She actually took and divided her, um, divided her mountains into different color shapes that were very, very distinct. Like um, she might have, have um, and of course I'm, I'm no, no great, no great artist um, like Georgia O'Keeffe. I enjoy it. Uh, now, I, I've decided that I, I would like this to be my favorite time of the day. Um, gonna, I'm going to get some very light red. Because I, I love, I, um, in fact, I'm going to go with yellow first. I really like um, both sunrise and sunset, so I'm gonna make this so it's at sunset. So I'm just gonna add a little bit of... Hmm. Need more water. I'm trying to blend here a little bit so that it doesn't, it, they aren't, um, and I'm avoiding the cloud at the moment. I've got a cloud there. And I'm going to put a little bit more purple into. Okay. Of course, I'm doing this, doing this awfully fast. 
to my satisfaction. Okay. Okay. So I, I'm making that. Oh, now the cloud though. And clouds usually, we think of them as being white, but sometimes they, they, they take on clouds um, have some grays. I'm going to put a little grays and maybe a little bit of little bit of purpley at the top here too. And at the bottom I'm gonna just gonna put some a little bit of okay so well uh, all right that that's that's my start here in fact I've got so you know that's um that's a way of taking and making making some art that is um um, more in, you know in the style of of Georgia O'Keeffe, and of course, it's um, it's you know your own way of doing it. The other thing that she she did a lot of, I'm going to show you um, a picture. First of all, let me show you her picture of, of the mountains. And um, the last thing she did drew a lot of, especially later in life, she drew a lot of pictures of clouds. And here's one of her clouds. And I want to show you how you can how you can start doing that. In fact, I'm going to I'm going to do this with with a with a marker so that you can see. So let me just grab a grab a marker because this uh, you wouldn't do a marker. Use a pencil yourself, but I want to show you um, how to get it so that it's kind of in a perspective. All right, here's a black marker. Let's do it. All right. So the first thing that you're going to do in making your making a cloud picture is you're going to decide where you would like where you would like the horizon. You know, the horizon is the place where the the land meets the sky. And this this actually she was she liked drawing her clouds. It wasn't um she didn't look up at the clouds. What she really liked to do was to be in an airplane and look down. And so that's kind of what this is in my mind more than anything else. So, all right. So, um you're gonna make make your horizon line. So you're just going to draw with pencil, not with permanent marker like me. I just want you to be able to see it. You're gonna draw just a line as straight as you can <laughs> there. And then you have to decide where you want, uh, you know, where are you going to be when you're, you're, you're here looking at this. And, that, and it's called like the focal point or the perspective I made my perspective just so that it's perfectly even. So you, then you're going to take and make a triangle like this. And I'm going to do another one and show you how to put that someplace else. All right, so now, if you are standing here, I also, I wanted, I wanted to have the sun coming up over the, over, the, over the horizon, so I just made a little sun there. So in fact, even if you look at my picture, doesn't it look like it's a long road and this is like a mountain in the background? That is kind of a trick to fool your eyes to make things um, look so. Things over here are smaller than there. So when you're doing your clouds, you want to make sure that that the clouds get get a little bit bigger as you as you go on out. So this is the important place to have the clouds like that. Is this um, this section here? Doesn't it look like um, like those others are farther away? And then for the rest of them, for the rest of the drawing, it doesn't make that much difference. I tried when um, it looks best if you do keep the ones down toward the end a little bit, um, you know, so that they they fit in that idea that they're bigger as you go along. see me get some more clouds here and of course you're not going to see that that big black line there so it's going to be an optical illusion that that everything is that these clouds are farther away let's see that okay so there you go. So there, that's how you kind of make your clouds. And um, 
I'm going to show you another another focal point here. So if I flip this over, that's I'm going to get a clean sheet because I can still see through that too much. So, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to draw that draw that line. In fact, I can, I can use a piece of paper to make it fairly straight here. In fact, I'm going to make this horizon a little bit bigger. And again, you would do this with a pencil, not with um, not with a, a marker. And rather than putting putting my um, focal point right in the center, I've decided that I want to make it a little bit off center. I want to put it like right over here. And what I'm doing is what's called changing the perspective of it. There we go. Like that. All right, so now, now my perspective is off. So, so um, we're actually we're actually standing. In fact, I just did that absolutely backwards. Did I? No, that's right. So up here, I'm going to have my my tiny clouds, and they're going to get a little bit bigger and bigger. And you can make your clouds any way you'd like them. have them go outside them. So now the perspective is there and um, it looks cool when you um, when, when you've got it all 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 done. Even though it looks looks weird with that, with that big um. There we go. There's my clouds. Even though it looks kind of weird with that um, triangle there, with, without seeing that, it will give that it will give that illusion of give that illusion of looking off into the distance, like that. It, it's pretty cool, and that's what uh, that's what she would have done exactly this sort of thing, uh, probably. You know, definitely not with a black marker and probably with better shaping clouds. And when you're painting your clouds, remember that, you know, clouds are not just, are not, not white or green, as that one is now. There, there are a lot of different colors. If you're doing it at, um, if I want to make this at sunrise. Okay. If I'm going to make that at sunrise, then, you know, the colors of the sky are what? There's probably some yellow and there's probably some it's like it's it's there's probably some pink this one of my favorite things in the morning is the, the beautiful pink and the other thing rather than you know in the night sky the colors kind of go pink and then into purple and then into black in um oh there's also this blue too uh, and it, it's also at sunrise but um when I look out in the morning at sunrise, I tend to see I tend to see colors more like that. And then when you're doing your clouds, um, you can also use those those same colors, kind of tinged in the clouds, so that your clouds aren't all aren't all white. They you know they should be probably you know pink. So, and then the background, you can, with watercolors, it's a challenge because they do blend together a bit, but um, then you can do your, and you can vary, you can have variations of that. Some of it can be bluer and some of them not as blue and stuff. So it, it's fun. I just think it's kind of a cool effect, learning how to use, how to um, use that focal point to create a new perspective. And it is, it is pretty effective. So again, if I was doing this at sunset, take a look out at the, at the sunset, see what colors. Um, I, I, if you're doing it today, you, know, you couldn't because it's gonna be, not gonna be a clear night, but a clear night, if you take a look at the colors, you know, definitely both times the, the pink and the blue are there, um, but the, the blue in, um, in the night sky does seem to go off into the purpley. But, um, 
it's it's pretty. All right, so that um, those are my my ideas. So I've got three of them for you today. That um, two of which she would have taught when she was teaching. One of which would have been to um, to take and simplify. Start with something that looks fairly realistic but loose. Get rid of details. Take a third of it and put it um, rather than making it the long way, make it the tall way. Take that third of it, and in a way, you know what, what you're doing is you're just making things more close. And another idea that I didn't show you, but um, would be to go and take uh, some pictures of things up close. I, I got a really pretty good picture of my cat's eye, <laughs> but I thought there's no way I can paint that. It, um, you would, I couldn't do it with watercolor. You need something more intense colors. But I, I took some pictures of. Um, my husband brought in some sage to cook yesterday. I got a really nice little picture of up close sage. So maybe I will paint that, that would be fun. So you could also take a picture of something up close or a part of something you don't look at usually. And, um, it, and you know, I, I, in fact, I took a pretty good picture of one of the outlets in our house and uh, we have made for our outlets, we've, um, I've taken and covered them all <laughs> in, um, in pictures so I, I found it, it was a pretty cool one of them pretty cool picture of, of one of the outlets with the you know all the design around it so just do whatever um whatever you feel like um you know try painting happy days maybe days that you are not happy maybe days you are mad what colors come out that'll give you an idea of what you you know what colors you associate with um with different emotions you know maybe for somebody purple's a happy color and for someone else purple's a a sad color. I always think of one of my favorite books is um, the My Many Colored Days of Dr. Seuss, and you know all the years reading it to my daughter, how we disagreed um, with Doc, with the the person who did the illustrations of what. Well, Dr. Seuss came up with the colors that purple was a sad color, and you know we both said, well, purple is really a pretty happy color. So everyone is different. You know what you what you think is right because <laughs> it's it's what you think when you're doing things so have fun with the colors come up with what you think try doing the cloud painting that's really fun and just try for an exercise look out your backyard or um look you know find a, a, a photograph or some place you really like if it's um you know the playground down the street take and simplify it um do it normal simplify and then flip on its side and you only use a third of it and um see what happens. You can be the next Georgia O'Keeffe. All right. Uh, see you next week. And I don't remember who it is next week. So maybe a surprise. All right. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming.